teaching training applications, virtual world dioramas, and student portfolio galleries. Our speaker is Kay McLennan. Kay is a professor of practice at the Tulane University School of Professional Advancement. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for her speaker bio, details of the sessions, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag pound OSCC23. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin the session. Thank you, Lear. It's my pleasure to participate in the OSCC 2023 event, and good morning to all of the early risers. Um, so today, um, I am, hope to uh, demonstrate two different applications, um, teaching applications, the use of dioramas and teaching portfolio materials, um, including the key features and construction tips uh, that I can share about this. And also, uh, as sort of a derivative of dioramas, uh, the use of student and faculty galleries for portfolio displays. But before we get started, um, I want to uh, call your attention to a survey um, that is um, online. And uh, this is my um, uh, attempt to hopefully showcase your builds um, at the Educator Emporium in, on Wrights Plaza in the OS Grid. Um, also, if you haven't been there um, to uh, stop by, um, the Emporium is going to be completely updated uh, in the coming months. And so even if you've stopped by in the past, please do so again. Um, I'm also skipping ahead to give you um, uh, the code for a Mentimeter presentation that will have uh, some audience participation slides. Again, this is a, a, a view of the Educator Emporium. And unfortunately, I recently realized that most of the showcase items on the roof um, are out of date. But throughout uh, yesterday and um, in uh, the lead up to the conference this weekend, I've come to realize there's plenty of brand new content that can be featured um, on the roof. So more to come about that. Um, but turning now to um, the use of dioramas and teaching portfolios, um, uh, let me skip ahead here. Um, uh, as other faculty uh, members, uh, my colleagues uh, can attest, um, we're required to periodically update our teaching portfolios. And uh, the last time, uh, two years ago, I was required to update my portfolio. Um, I wanted to add a DEI, a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement to my teaching philosophy. And I sort of sat and stared at a blank piece of paper. I had several examples, but it wasn't until I started building little dioramas in OpenSim and my OpenSim grid at the time that it all sort of came together. Um, I just went through different uh, developments, the type of um, uh, uh, anti-diversity uh, that I experienced uh, in my growing up and in my professional uh, career, um, sort of all uh, created these uh, rather distinct segments of uh, even when I first started to read, there were separate and unequal job listings. Um, I remember in junior high school having to fight to wear pants to school because our assistant principal thought it wasn't ladylike. Um, also in college, uh, I, I heard from several quarters that rigorous academic uh, courses of study were for men only. Um, of course, I didn't take heed. Um, in the workplace, women take jobs away from men. And then finally, uh, the segment that um, uh, I highlighted is higher education as a change maker. 
Um, the 3D uh, displays all come uh, or were set up with frames, um, a frame of the scene or a relevant scene, and then uh, it provide note card uh, giver scripts for note cards with a description of the scene, the type of discrimination it represents, um, and how this particular discrimination or topic area um, informed my informs and continues to inform my teaching. Um, uh, also, uh, each of the galleries includes a mailbox to receive student responses. Um, so uh, not only, again, was did this turn out to be um, uh, uh, pivotal in terms of um, uh, enabling me and helping me to uh, overcome this challenging task of uh, writing this segment of my teaching philosophy. But I was able to then use uh, screen capture images and even a video tour of uh, my gallery um, in my teaching portfolio. Um, and then uh, it was a hop, skip, and a jump um, uh, to uh, imagining that maybe the use of dioramas uh, could be of keen interest for other student writing projects. Um, I don't teach um, composition, um, so uh, I fear uh, I have no way to kind of test out this idea, but perhaps uh, other K through 12 or college instructors um, may have an opportunity to test out whether their creation of different uh, types of sets or dioramas may motivate uh, student composition. Um, so, uh, again, after uh, creating my own, it was easy to duplicate um, the at least the uh, the gallery images, the frames with the note givers. Um, and a mailbox for each of the student galleries. I stacked them up. Um, and uh, the features that um, I employed, I, I always pre-create avatars in OpenSim. Um, and so it was easy to then, you know, preload pre-created avatars with content. So uh, if I linked all of the frames and the mailbox together, um, I could then just uh, set it up in, a, you know, a, a given student's gallery. Um, I kept all the frames linked except, you know, the images and the note card giver prim so that students would easily um, be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, edit uh, their gallery. Um, unfortunately, I, I had a number of students that were quite interested over the past few semesters but then in the end, you know, I uh, didn't get any takers. Um, I believe uh, that students um, uh, are pretty time pressed, especially my students that are possibly even working parents. Um, so I fear I haven't tested actually the student use. Um, I'm not sure whether the learning curve is too steep. Again, um, in the past, pre-created avatars and pre-installed uh, content has been easy for students to use. Still, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the pandemic had both pros and cons for us um, in the sense that it mainstreamed um, the use of webinars and Zoom, um, which uh, has also been a, a bonus for virtual worlds to be able to uh, teach students how to use virtual worlds using a webinar is uh, brilliant. Um, but yet, I think that we've been tarnished by the Zoom fatigue that was experienced um, and prevalent during the pandemic. Um, so moving next, I thought it would be fun to um, get your views on some of these items, and then I'm hoping for some comments and feedback. Um, if you have a, a, a second browser window open, or perhaps you can use your mobile device to go to menti.com and then enter the code, um, and the code is 9220. Um, 
Um, seven, six, nine, one. And I have, uh, just for illustration, I put uh, a screen with a media on a prim um, uh, on uh, the stage today. But um, it's not, I'm not logged in. So uh, unfortunately, um, it is not um, going to, as far as I know, display uh, the... Let me go ahead. Um, it's not going to display, I believe, the choices. So the first question is, um, what is your experience with simulations? Um, and you can collect more than one. Um, by the way, uh, Mintmeter.com includes both um, free and um uh, subscription um, uh, choices. Um, please wait for the presenter to show the next slide. Um, so we've got almost equal um, seven and eight, eight, a second life open sim, uh, some, uh, a few less single use uh, simulations, and um, even less, one less virtual reality headset. So it looks like we're all in basically the same boat here. Um, and as part of your open sim or second life use, how much do you use custom build simulations in virtual world platforms? And the choices here are never, rarely, um, uh, occasionally, frequently, or always. And I'm delighted and pleased to see that so far, uh, well, frequently and always uh, are leading the pack here um, at 38% each. Um, well, we're down frequently 50% uh, as it comes in. You know, next time, uh, I apologize, I will log into my media on a prim and test to see how that is working out. Um, I was thinking that it, uh, the lag would um, uh, not facilitate using it, but it would really be help for you to see the uh, results. Uh, the third question, um, let me see if I've got, if uh, an in-world building uh, option became possible um, in VR platforms, how do you see yourself uh, creating custom simulations in VR platforms? That is, uh, with the uh, typical expectation that um, uh, that uh, it, most of the VR platforms don't allow um, uh, in-world building tools. Um, if that became uh, available, would that change uh, your view? And it looks like frequently uh, sort of the same um, the same participation rate. So it seems like the audience feels, as I do, that in-world building tools are going to be uh, essential for the growth of VR platforms. Um, for question number four, and again, yes, it looks like it's concentrated there. What do you believe to be the top factor or factors limiting the use of virtual world simulations? And this should be um, multiple uh, uh, multiple answers possible. And the choices include uh, equipment costs, mobile device uh, trends or, or lack of mobile device trends, uh, we're still waiting, use difficulty for students, use difficulty for fact, faculty, VR headset competition, and carryover Zoom fatigue. And so far, it looks like equipment cost and use difficulty for uh, students are our top contenders, uh, use difficulty for faculty too, um, mobile uh, device trend is more significant at 18% than um, I would have imagined. Um, so all of that is, is fascinating. 
All right. I just got the five minute warning. Um, so we'll quickly go to the final question, which is um, the top factor you believe to be limiting the use of virtual reality headset uh, simulations and the same equipment cost, no in world building tools, use difficulty for uh, students, use difficulty for faculty. Um, and let me. Quickly go ahead. Equipment cost is number one, followed by no in-world building tools. I can see that everybody uh, in this group feels as I do about it. <laughs> um, and use difficulty is still significant. Uh, less, Much less significant uh, is carryover Zoom fatigue. Um, so that might, that might be uh, my answer alone. Let's see where, where we are. All right, um, at this juncture, I want to open it up for comments or questions. And Lear, I'm not sure if you're still uh, uh, in pocket, but um, is there anything I've missed in the way of questions or comments so far? So far, no. Well, the comments have been confirmatory to what you were saying. Like Franz had some comments, Rihanna and myself. And then I also linked an example. <clears throat> One of my students, I had made the same statement that there were a lack of VR design tools. So he created a video for me for part of his final project showing a build of his <laughs> that integrated video and uh, VR designs. And he's in the VR world assembling it on his video. So I just linked that in the audience as well. Oh, fabulous. Thought you might find that fun. Thank you. Yes. That's what and I love about students. You know, you just give them a challenge and bam. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I think we're in early days with the VR headsets and I was fascinated by the talk uh, yesterday about uh, headsets and um, uh, we'll see where that goes um, uh, too. So, um, Let's see, anything else? Um, let's see here. Um, Ada does comment headsets so far trigger nausea um, and headaches, especially in women. And I have uh, experienced that myself, um, especially in VR applications that don't have stops on movement. If you can jerk yourself around in the headset, I have gotten sick. And it's not a, a, something I can easily get over. You know, it takes me a couple hours. Um, I've also got, um, uh, you know, uh, gouges in the paint in the wall behind my desk <laughs> from oh. certain applications. Uh, and then even found myself, you know, like six feet away from my desk once when I was in an application. I thought, boy, it's a good thing there's no stairs here. <laughs> Because of some of the uh, head tracking, the focus, and the convergence problems, almost everyone at some point will have some discomfort. So uh, please realize it's not just women or head sizes. And uh, there's been a lot of studies about it. I, I started studying it in 1995, K. So, uh, you know, it, while it may be getting better, it's still not there yet. So... Uh, Sounds good. And Lisa uh, says she's inspired and comforted by building an OS. So uh, uh, I feel the same. Um, Ada says research says one reason is the distance between our eyes different than men. That's interesting. Um, I see I've just got uh, I'm into my 60 second warning. Um, uh, we'll see who gets the last word here. Frank Frank's getting the last word also has to do with frame rate. All right, uh, Lear and everyone again, thank you for coming and please uh, uh, consider showcasing your simulation Congratulations in the Educator Emporium and the form uh, to fill that out is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Kay, for an informative and interesting presentation. You know, Kay has a booth in the OSCC Expo Zone 3, uh, booth 22nd, too, in the, in the very center. And then, of course, the Educator Emporium is at uh, OS Grid at Wright Plaza. 
As a reminder to our audience, you will want to check out the conference.opensimulator.org to see what is coming up on the conference schedule. You won't want to miss our next session, which begins at 7.30 a.m. in this keynote region, and it's entitled Cultivate, Collaborate, Celebrate, and Innovate. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 23 at Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and to explore the hypergrid resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with our sponsor and our crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again, Kay, and to you, the audience.